On this episode of Pilot's Discretion, our guest is author, professor, and airline pilot, Sidney Decker. He talks about drifting into failure, human factors, and restoring a Cessna 172. Pilot's Discretion starts right now. Welcome, pilots. I'm your host, John Zimmerman, and thanks for listening to Pilot's Discretion from Sporties. You can catch up on every previous episode by visiting sporties.com slash podcast, and you can email us at podcast at sporties.com. Today, I'm thrilled to have Sidney Decker with us, one of the most respected names in aviation safety, and indeed on the topic of safety across all industries. Over the course of 15 books, hundreds of articles, and countless presentations around the world, he has introduced concepts like human factors and just culture to millions of people in industries ranging from aviation to healthcare. He is currently a professor at Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia, but most importantly for us, he is an experienced pilot with many hours logged in a Boeing 737, and he owns a Cessna 172 that he refurbished. Sydney, welcome to Pilot's Discretion. Thank you so much, John. Happy to be here. I'm going to start with a broad question to set the stage for our conversation, and I'm sure we could spend the whole show on this, but at a high level, if we think about a typical aviation accident, maybe confessing there is no such thing as typical, but if I think of the most recent accident I've read about, how much of that is typically caused by the pilot sitting in the left seat, and how much of that is caused by the system or the broader uh, mechanics behind that? Oh, that that's an awful question, John. That's a question that belongs firmly in the 17th century. You know, when we were still thinking about, you know, the 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 and the 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 sort of the real world and sort of the mental world, right? That this Rene Descartes all over. You know, since the Enlightenment, we think differently about these things. I think the, the the most useful way to think about this is actually to think in terms of people in systems rather than people or systems. I think it's stupid. I think it's stupid to say, oh, it's 70 percent human error. I mean, what does that even mean? Right. Well, how do you count this um, for that matter <laughs> among the scientific crowd? What is a human error? Right. Uh, I mean, since 1943, we've been writing and debating this and we're still not in agreement. So that's not going to happen within this podcast either. So so the stupid question. So so the question is, um, how do we get to understand people in systems? Because um, if, if we understand them sort of as a unit of analysis, right, this is sort of the cognitive system, which consists of a head and perhaps another person, but also intelligent or semi-intelligent or autonomous machinery in or around the pilot, um, which makes decisions, which offers information, which has particular, supposedly sort of, I'm anthropomorphizing now, but certain opinions about things or certain ideas or intentions that it doesn't communicate very well. It is the cognitive system, the whole, the unit that we need to understand in order to say, hey, this is how it actually went well or went wrong. Um, so I, I haven't answered the question because I don't, anyway. So. Fair enough. <laughs> One of the things that I think is interesting on, on that topic, which I agree 100%, it's a, it's a false dichotomy. But the standard model for risk management that pilots get sort of beat into their system during primary training is, especially in the last 15, 20 years, as the FAA has gotten serious about risk management as a topic for primary training, it's all about identifying potential risks and then mitigating those risks. But reading your work, it makes me question how many of those risks we really know about. You specifically, I've seen you write about this naive Newtonian scientism. So tell us about that and, and yeah. how much risk we really can understand or predict. I, I think the, um, in answer to the question that, that concluded your, um, your little exposition there, John, I, I don't think we can ever come to a uh, answer about how much risk that it is sort of quantifiable or, you know, I have three risks. I've managed them well. Well, how do you know? <laughs> you know, because you may not have managed a risk that actually didn't bite you in the butt. Right. And so, um, this is the thing. It is, it is really a matter of definitions and, and understanding of what is around you. Um, I, I, I'm sure we've all been in situations where we've been mightily surprised uh, at the controls of an airplane that something actually turned out to be a risk that we had no idea about, right? So how do you manage that other than d just digging yourself out of the surprise of being smacked in the face with it? Um, so it's it's... Yes, it's a worthwhile effort. Of course, it is. I, and, and both on part of the FAA and schools, and I think individual pilots. Um, the, the, the standard practices that we've all had, and I think, and this is how I fly my 172, particularly, not my, my carbon cub a little bit, but that's a different sort of operation. But the 172 IFR, 
that even if it's single pilot is totally a, a sort of an airline operation, right? With the call outs to myself, with the mode change call outs, with the, 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 the flow of the work and then the checklist rather than, you know, with a finger on the checklist and then using it as a do list, right? Which I think is both stupid and unprofessional. Um, and I think many airline pilots who are on the call who are also GA single pilots would agree. Um, so that already, John, manages so much of the risk that typically shows up in a flight, right? Because you've got it covered, right? Because you've went, you've gone through it, right? And in some sense, the, um, the, the reminder to ask yourself, is there anything I've missed, right? As soon as you have a little moment in your flight and you sit there and you go, okay, I'm pretty fat, dumb, and happy. Don't be, <laughs> because you don't, you probably don't deserve to be, right? There's probably something that you should be thinking about or doing or checking or having a look at. And so that's the question you should ask yourself, right? Precisely because we cannot define all the risks in advance, precisely because it is largely situational and context determined, ask yourself, what is it that I'm not doing? What haven't I looked at, right? And so as soon as you feel happy in, in, in what you're doing, um, look a bit further, um, right? You know, safety is, 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 is this, um, yeah, this, this state of, of um, being happy about nothing happening, which is, which is really, I mean, how, how do you even handle that cognitively, right, psychologically? So ask yourself that question. You've written and talked about why we should look for why things go right instead of just obsessing about when they go wrong. Why do you think that's an important distinction mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to safety? Yeah, thanks for that, John. Well, first of all, I, the, the word right is a bit problematic because once again, that, that lures us into this Newtonian thinking. There's only one right way, one right method. Now, okay, for certain mechanical systems and, you know, how do you start a CFM 56 engine on a 737 when it's cold? There is one right way, right? And as a professor, right, I sat there and, and, and I, I, I mucked around with the switches in a way that the, the other pilot didn't like. And so I was told, you know, stop thinking, start doing, you know, and I go, well, I get paid to think. I'm a professor not here you're, you're so not here you're not and so um so there might be one right way for certain procedures and, and and sequences but generally we'd like to say well why do things go well because there are many ways to skin a cat right even when you're operating a 172 or or a, or a baron um right they're very right when do you drop the gear right i mean this really depends on on when you um on the whole approach sequence and all kinds of other things and so um so but why did we start asking this question and of course my colleague eric holnago has written so much about safety and this kind of safety uh, um, that some listeners might might know about um he, he likes to call it safety too, right? I call it safety differently, but this idea of understanding that actually much more goes well than goes wrong. Whatever your accident statistics are in your world, and healthcare is, you know, is pretty bad in this, right? A safe hospital typically is like 5% of patients get harmed in the, in the process of receiving care, which is relatively safe because 95% doesn't, right? So it's still, I mean, 5% is a lot, don't get me wrong. Um, but more goes well than goes wrong. If we understand why it goes well, then we have a sense of the capacities that make it so. What are the capacities that make things go well? Well, we have a fairly good, good sense of this. First of all, yes, sort of the procedural discipline that I talked about initially, right? Yet also understanding that that basis of procedural discipline then allows you the possibility to vary, to accommodate circumstances that didn't fit with the procedure. You go, oh, okay, hang on now. I need a different mode to do this descent in because I'm being told different things and I can't figure out the automation quick enough on this Garmin thing in my cockpit, right? And so, which has happened, <laughs> you know? Um, and so um, the, uh, why do they go well? So what are some of the capacities that we see? Even in, in single, single person operations, uh, John, what we see is, the capacity to not take success behind you as a guarantee for success in front of you, right? The fact that you were successful so far says absolutely nothing in a dynamic changing world, right? And so this is, I mean, I, I come back to the fat, dumb and happiness and sitting there. No, 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 ask yourself questions because the fact that it's been going well so far, 
is not a predictor, right? So past results are not a predictor for future outcomes necessarily. So, so that sort of skepticism uh, about yourself and about the world in which you operate um, is clearly a capacity for success. And we see this in team in teams as well, right? And so um, the uh, the other one is uh, is of course particularly in teamwork. If you fly with others, uh, it is the um, it is the ability to say stop. The simple ability to say no, the legitimation of pulling the plug. Um, now, I, I, I've flown, and I was going to talk about this, uh, John. I've flown a bunch with uh, because I was based out of out of Copenhagen, and and so Scandinavia, as many of the listeners would know, is a, is, a, is um, gender equality sort of leaders of the world, right? And so the um, lots of female captains when I was a co-pilot, and so lots of female captains, and typically the males never did this because testosterone somehow gets in the way or something, right? But but the female captains. Uh, would typically say something like this, All right, Sid, we're going to fly this thing down to Malaga or some other banana field and then back up to Copenhagen. And so if there's anything about my flying that you don't like, you tell me, and I will do the same with you. And I'm, I'm going, how hard can it be to create this little microclimate of, as Amy Edmondson calls it now, psychological safety? Right? where it's safe to speak up, where you can put your reputation and your yourself on the line by saying, I actually don't think that's a good course of action. I disagree with that. Um, you have, I mean, if you're, if you're the commander of that flight, you still have to live up to that promise that you make before pushback, sure. Um, and, and when push comes to shove, you have to show the courage to, be, to in fact, acknowledge that you're wrong um, and that you're open for opinions from people that have a lower status. Um, but that is definitely a capacity that we've seen, John, that makes things go well. In fact, it, it goes as far to, to, to uh, some of the, the healthcare results that we have um, is that teams where you have more dissenting members, literally dissenting with the course of action, produce safer outcomes, which is interesting, right? So it's, if everybody is in agreement, be afraid. As a patient, be really afraid, right? So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, obviously, but, but th that's what the results are telling us. The, the other thing, and, and then I'll stop because, I mean, we can keep enumerating capacities until we're blue in the face, but a really important one, and I think almost every pilot on the call can relate to this, um, and that is pride of workmanship. It does make a difference. It actually makes a difference. If you're proud of what you do, if you have pride, um, I mean, as a pilot, you're only as good as your last landing, right? And everybody knows that, which is kind of depressing. Uh, on the other hand, it's also something that inspires that pride of workmanship, right? That it can always be done better. There's always room for improvement, right? You're never perfect, but you can be proud of your accomplishments so far and then look for improvements, right? That pride of workmanship is correlated, and in the research that we've done, is correlated with better outcomes. Now, what, I, what we don't know <laughs> is what is causal. I mean, do you have better outcomes because you have pride of workmanship, or are you proud of your work because you have a good outcome? I don't know. And then I would want to ask you the question, does it even matter? <laughs> it doesn't even matter. What I would like to encourage, and I mean, Deming, right, and people in quality, uh, quality assurance have written about this. Pride of workmanship matters. I have seen pilots who are not proud of the way they fly the airplane. There's a sloppiness. There is a cooking the stick. There is a, right, there's a, um, and you go, why, 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 why do you? And, and so uh, it, it, it's, it's something that I've, in my own experience, also as an instructor, John, I found very difficult to engender in pilots that don't have it from the beginning. But now I'm on, on the very slippery terrain of, you know, nature versus nurture a little bit. But yeah, anyway, so I've, <laughs> I'm in a rabbit hole, my friend. Rescue me. I would say the very least, if you take pride in it and you're constantly seeking to do better, it may make you safer, but at the very least, you'll enjoy it more. And especially if you're a general aviation pilot who's doing it for the challenge or the reward uh, or enjoying the ride and not just the destination, at the very least, it makes it more enjoyable. So I think that's uh, that's absolutely sound advice for all kinds of reasons. And if you're not enjoying the craft of it, I wonder why you're in aviation in a sense, because that's the ultimate reward to me. Sure, it's fun to go somewhere. It's 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 fun to check a box and accomplish a mission, but really it's the process that uh, that makes it so enjoyable. It, it does. It does, John. And just one, one final uh, coda on this, and that is, you know, as Chuck Yeager already reminded all of us, right, safer pilots are the ones who do it more often. And so if you don't enjoy it, actually, I mean, yes, one option is to do it less or don't do it at all. But another option is to do it a heck of a lot more. 
And so fly more, fly often, and you'll be safer and you'll start to enjoy it more because you free up more cognitive space. Great advice. I think that is a key part to enjoying it more. I want to ask you about Drift into Failure. This is uh, one of probably your best known works and I think has so much application into aviation. Uh, and, and you wrote, a, I thought, a great description of this. Quote, in the stories of drift into failure, organizations fail precisely because they are doing well on a narrow range of performance criteria, that is. The ones that they get rewarded on in their current political or economic or commercial configuration. In the drift into failure, accidents can happen without anything breaking, end quote. So I, th I think that's a critical piece, especially in a world where we're all living with really incredibly safe airline performance, at least on that base measure of how many airplanes crashed in the last 30, 60, 90 days. So tell me about drift into failure and how that shows up in aviation and what might be a clue that I need to, you know, be paying attention as a pilot. Thank you for that question, John. Yeah, uh, Wow, that could become um, sort of a, a thesis length answer, which or a book length answer. Um, so, <laughs> Drift is, in fact, one of the books that I have read. I mean, I wrote it, I know, but I haven't. I haven't read all the books that I've written, but I've certainly read Drift because it's an audio book, and uh, the publisher wanted it read by me. But the uh, which is a very solipsistic experience. Um, I'm evading answering your question um, because I don't know how to answer. Um, but let me let me give it a shot. So the idea of drifting into failure comes basically on the back of the space shuttle accidents that NASA uh, suffered um, in the uh, in the eighties and nineties um, with Columbia and Challenger. And so, um, w what the research was showing at the time was um, that within a technologically slightly uncertain system and sort of unfinished system. Um, we, we, we kept pushing it to the edges of the, of the envelope. Um, and we kept taking success literally as a guarantee for future success. Um, and what happens then is that you typically borrow a little bit more. You go, well, hey, so far it went well. So let's, let's, if, even if the, the chunk of, of foamed up, you know, iced up foam is this large, it has gone well so far, or, um, in these temperatures, it's launched well. So, um, and, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm utterly oversimplifying and doing deep injustice to the, to the enormous engineering complexity surrounding all of this, of course, but, um, but in, in the interest of time, drift happens when, um, we take little steps, um, toward these production rewards, for example, or the ability to to get to a destination or to take more people or to do it with fewer engines, or as is being debated right now, John, and many airline airline colleagues on the call will, 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 will know this, um, with reduced crew ops, right? And say, well, hey, we're so safe. We're so good. You know, we are so technologically, technologically advanced. Uh, we have such a great record. We can do with fewer people. Right. And so we can fly long stretches with only two on, on, on the front. And so, um, all of these things are a great idea until they're not. The thing is, when do you know that they're not? And that's what drift is all about, right? It's this, this increasing borrowing against basically a safety margin, uh, because of all the great results you're getting in. Um, and one of the, one of the things that I'd love to tell the industry and do tell the industry and not just aviation, but is to say, as long as you keep measuring your success by the absence of negative events, you risk drifting into failure, right? Uh, because it's sort of the fundamental regulator paradox, right? I mean, the more goes well, the less goes wrong. If the very little goes wrong, what the hell do you have to measure? I mean, I mean, at some point, I mean, you've got some industries that go, oh, we want zero harm, right? Which is a nonsensical thing. But, um, but if it's zero, I, how are you going to run your system? I mean, anybody who's a control engineer would go, well, that doesn't sound very safe to me. You know, I have a system, I'm running it. It's pretty complicated, but it's not telling me anything. I'm not getting any data. Right? So what are you going to do tomorrow? Right? Just hope for the same. That's not how it works. So the, again, I mean, this takes us back to the previous conversation. If you want to prevent drift into failure, you'd better understand why you make things go well how they actually go well. What is it that you're doing to get the result that you are when you go, hmm, we well, got there in time, but I actually had only 88 liters in the tanks, right? Which actually is below the whatever, you know, conditions you fly under um, in whatever equipment. 
Um, and it's, it's that question you need to ask, right? So it's great that we got here and that we walked away from the landing and that we're all safe. But ha- what did we not do? What do we borrow against, right? What trade-off did we make? What sacrifice did we make to achieve this result? That's the question we need to ask, John. That's the question you need to ask to stop drifting to failure. Because then you go, wow, yeah, it's a great result. And so far, if, 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 you know, if you get these people looking at your zero, you know, oh, we got zero accidents, they're still happy. But what did you sacrifice to get there? That's the question to ask. That's the conversation to have. Yeah, wonderful point. It reminds me of the French film, and the, there's the, the story in there, something about the guy that jumps off the 100-story building. And for 99 of the 100 floors, he says, so far, so good. But uh, it's the last one that counts. So <laughs> careful about taking your lessons from past experience. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, one one final question wrapping up on, on some of these safety topics. We've talked a lot about uh, some might say theoretical or higher level safety concepts. And on, uh, you wrote in a recent article, our technologies have gotten ahead of our theories, which is an interesting statement. But I guess one response I could see some listeners having is, why does the theory even matter? You know, can't I just follow the checklist and the SOPs and it'll work out okay? Why do I need to understand the theoretical level here? <laughs> I would love to invite a skeptical listener like that into a conversation about, for example, AI in a reduced crew ops cockpit a couple of years from now, right? We better have a bloody good theory of, of how that is going to work and particularly how it's not going to work before we, you know, blindly follow procedures around it and think that we're getting faithful, reliable, valid answers. Um, so theory is everything. There's nothing, of course, da da da, as practical as a you know as a good theory. Um, but of course, as a scientist, you know, I, I would have to say that because it's <laughs> I get held accountable for it in, in what I do at the university. But um, but even, even as a pilot, um, I think it is. Um, I actually find it really useful to have a kind of a theory running in my head for how the trim system works on my Garmin autopilot, right? Um, and so not only to troubleshoot, because actually it's, it's, it's an amazing autopilot and, and I'm not plugging it in, in any way, but it's, it really is very nice and it hasn't failed me yet. Um, but to have some sense of predicting what's going to happen if I do certain things to, um, to, 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 to the system and, and the settings. And so, um, in that sense, there is nothing as good as a as a as a theory. I mean, Nadine Sarter, my colleague at Ohio State, um, when I was uh, a grad student there, um, she uh, she put it beautifully. She says, "What we need to be careful of is not just teaching the pilot how to work the system. We have to get them some sense of how the system works." And that's a theory, John. That is a theory, right? Because if you just teach a pilot how to work the system, how in the heck are they going to deal with a surprise? How are they going to deal with a moat surprise or some other surprise? Or, you know, you have to have some sense of how, um, how, the, uh, how the system works. Now, that said, this is why I was desperately, desperately dissatisfied with, with the 737 type rating. It was, it was sort of, I mean, within the constraints of the industry and what we're willing to pay for it, I, under, I understand that my airline did the best they could, right? And so nobody comes to work to do a bad job. And, but... John, if, if all I understand of the hydraulic systems of a 737 is, is a bunch of squiggly lines on a page in the FCOM, you know, or it would, it, and, and that was what I would love to do. But, you know, we're engineering nerds, right? It, it's just crawl through the bloody thing and trace it out and go, oh, this one is here. And there, you know, there's a valve there. So um, it never had the chance. And so I felt perpetually underprepared to actually drive to think. Yes, I knew how to work the system. Yeah. But many systems, I didn't know how they worked. And so that was unsatisfying. And so, yeah, there's other ways to learn. And, I, you know, there's additional books and literature that is written around the sort of manuals for these jets and, and many pilots who fly them would know that. And, and so I've read up on it. Still not the same as crawling through it, though. Yeah, well said. I think it ties back into the point about taking pride in, in the craft of it, because Part of taking pride in, in appreciating the craft and working on it is going to that next level and understanding the theory. 
That's so true, John. And, and, and so, and, and I know we're out of time, but, but um, I, I firmly believe, right, that b- because of this, right, yes, we can blame human error, but it always comes from somewhere, right? We have an error, produ- an expertise producing system that simultaneously produces error, right? Yes, we produce partic- particular kinds of expertise for you to fly the 737 if you rated on the thing. But that same system produces error because of all the gaps and, and, and knowledge bugs that show up in it because of the superficial way in which we do this, right? And so I firmly believe, John, and I, I really want to hammer this home with everybody who's listening, people on the line don't make bad choices. They have bad choices. They are given bad choices, right? And that's what drove me to write the first field guide in the early 2000s, right? After the the Cali accident, 1996, down in Colombia, right? With Nick and Donnie flying down and doing everything they could to, uh, to, to do the operation well, and then get bitten in the butt by basically a database error issue, right? That they, that the airplane had inherited from the database supplier. And, and, an automation surprise that was a lateral one rather than a vertical one. We hadn't seen that yet, right? And going into the mountains as a result. And so everybody after that was saying, oh, they they mucked up and they, you know, bad pilots, this and that. They weren't. Donnie was was instructor of the year in the Air Force, right? But these were really good guys, right? I mean, they knew what they were doing. You'd, you'd have your family fly with these with these guys, right? And so, but afterwards we go, oh, well, I would have never have done that <laughs> in our omniscient hindsight, you know, now that you know the outcome. Um, so my, my first book was very much a rant, not a rant, but a sort of an explanation. Is it, we have to do this better, community, colleagues. We, we have to do this better because they did not show up to work to do a bad job that morning in Miami. They did not show up to kill themselves, right? And 163 other people, they didn't. They just wanted to go to Cali and back. That's what you do, right? Sydney well said, let's take a quick break and we'll be back with some more questions. Earn all your pilot ratings and keep your flying skills sharp with Sporty's Pilot Training Plus. This all-inclusive membership unlocks Sporty's complete library of award-winning video courses so you can learn anywhere you have your phone, tablet, or laptop. For one annual fee, you get access to over $1,500 in courses, a smart investment in your flying career. Plus, enjoy free shipping every day of the year at sporties.com and apply for one of our three annual flight training scholarships. Learn more at sporties.com slash pilot training. Now, back to pilot's discretion. We are back with Sidney Decker, who, when he's not writing or teaching, likes to spend a lot of time flying his Cessna 172. Now, Sydney, this is an airplane you basically rebuilt from the ground up after it spent mm. a tough life in the Australian outback. You wrote a great article <laughs> on this, and you said it was, quote, the foolishness of buying a tired, worn-out airplane without having seen it. And yet the end result looks pretty great. It's a beautiful-looking remade airplane. So explain why this actually <laughs> isn't as crazy as it sounds and why maybe a wannabe airplane owner might do this. Interesting. Is that what I wrote? It's, it, 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 of course, this is foolish, right? And, and, and every spouse would tell you just this, right? As you haven't seen the thing. You're plunking down a lot of money for it. Um, so, so John, yeah. So how did that come about? So, so basically, um, and COVID hadn't quite happened yet, but it was about to happen, um, which certainly confirmed the wisdom of investing in a in a, an IFR platform, um, and so uh, an affordable one. Um, here's here's how it came about. So I um, uh, the the airline I'd be flying for went bankrupt, so no more seven thirty seven flying, right? Which happens to a lot of colleagues probably who who, who have flown for airlines or you know are in or out or between, uh, and so oh, particularly on the back of COVID, obviously. So um, I'm thinking uh, sitting in the back of one of these things is is such a singularly miserable experience. Um, that I, I want to tr- avoid doing that ever again. Of course, I would love to have had, you know, uh, I don't know, a Piper Malibu or something, you know, or something, you know, it's, it, it, turbine would be nice. And um, But I don't have that money, right? And so uh, what I was, and, and for that matter, I don't have to go that fast because I love flying. And so, I mean, this is a question that one one of my my, my 
pilot buddies asked me, he said, why do you want to go fast, right? Don't you like flying? <laughs> and so I'm going, that's such a good point. Um, you know, looking out over over the the, the, the unpeopled world from uh, you know the, the the surround windows of a one seven two is actually an astounding privilege. You know, when you're cruising at nine thousand on your autopilot and and IFR filed. And anyway, so um, now, so why the one seven two? So um, so what what ha- So I had recently, bef- you know, before purchasing uh, this particular one, uh, flown the new generation one seven two, which I hadn't done before. Of course, like. Probably everybody on the call. Um, I'd flown plenty of pre um, uh, uh, pre uh, what, what is it? The General Aviation Revitalization Act, I think it was called, one seven twos, which were a bit dinky and toy like and 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 and, and flaky. Uh, you fly this new gen, you go, hang on, how on earth is there so much to improve on a one seven two? And, and, you know, not the wing, because the wing was perfect to begin with, right? Never wind tunnel tested as far as I understand, right? And so it was a perfect wing to begin with. And a super kind wing, right? As those who fly would know. I mean, it, it has no vices, absolutely none. Um, and so the, um, uh, I, I'd flown, hired a few, um, flown them and went, wow, this is actually a really nice platform. Um, then I looked at the budget and I'm going, okay, uh, Constant speed prop, 182, be nice, but constant speed means more systems. More systems mean stuff can break. Stuff breaks equals dollars, right? You go, okay, well, what about a 182 retractable? You know, you go, oh, okay, or something else retractable. That's a lot of extra systems, right? A lot of extra stuff that can break. And so so I started sort of paring it down and saying, so what can I afford if it breaks? <laughs> so um, I mean, that's that's super unromantic. So, so perhaps, you know, perhaps it wasn't, that ill-advised to begin with, actually. Now that I, I I'm reconfiguring my, my my story here, um, but the um, so then what happened is um, you start looking for a, a, a nice uh, one se- one seven two new generation. Well, forget about it, right? Uh, and those that are available are more expensive than the ones that roll off the factory in in Wichita, um, because you know they're available. And so. Um, so then um, I had seen um, an, an article uh, about a, a completely revitalized uh, PA-28, and, uh, and they actually put a diesel engine in it and, and that sort of thing. So I thought, okay, well, that could be an option un- until you realize that, yeah, that's a very expensive conversion, and, and it doesn't have a time between overhauls. It has a time between replacement. And you go, hmm, okay, so after a couple thousand hours, I'm looking at a completely new one. Um, all of that sounds Expensive and super nice to fly Jet A, of course. Uh, in a, in a, but anyway, so um, I then started looking around, and this cattle station. And so, for listeners who don't live in Australia, and so, and, and I, this is my seventh country, right? But every, and so I'm from the Netherlands originally, which is sort of the tiniest, most pop, well, not the tiniest, but a very densely populated piece of Europe. Um, and so, uh, being in Australia is 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 a ridiculous experience in the sense that distances here are 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 literally um, unfathomable. I mean, just difficult to imagine. Um, so this one was about, I don't know, 1,600 miles. I mean, it's, it's as large as the U.S., right? Except it has like 14 million people in it or 17 million. I mean, it's so just fancy how empty it is, right? Um, and so uh, this was in the middle of the country um, at a cattle station where it had done, um, I thought it was just for water bore checking and, and, and doing the occasional run down to the store or the post office or something. No, these people have actually been mustering in it. <laughs> So, wow. flying low between trees and oh man so the old things are quite crazy in that sense right and so um but it, it, very pragmatic right stuff just needs to happen there's a, lo- a lot of resources that you don't have when you're all the way out there you just use what you have right and so uh so they'd be mustering cattle uh with uh with this 172 as well as a few others it had come into the country actually uh for uh the Singapore airlines training college in perth um and they they got rid of it at some point and then it was brought out to this cattle station. We flew it back um, into a, a rising sun and we were IFR already because the windscreen had so been sandblasted right, with all the dust and crap that you fly in over there. So it was very difficult to see through. So 
already the budget is blowing out, right? You go, oh man, I gotta have a new windscreen. <laughs> so new windscreen be- becomes new windows all around. And oh, John, it's impossible to budget for these things, right? Um, at least twice, if not more, right? Um, and don't tell the spouse, right? And so, and, and don't use the family budget for it. I mean, have some sequestered money that you play with, right? Um, but the thing is, the wonderful thing is, I could then, together with my, uh, my Lamy, um, Nigel Arnold, um, here, um, completely. So, let me start, uh, licensed aircraft uh, uh, maintenance engineer, uh, mechanical engineer. Um, the um, completely designed it from the ground up, and so we built a airline aesthetic IFR platform, sumptuous leather seats, um, beautiful sort of uh, you know Boeing beige, uh, so that I I know what I'm looking at, I recognize it, <laughs> and so, um, but a very calm, beautiful interior. Um, most important thing is my wife absolutely loves it. She loves flying in it. And so she's a biochemistry professor and much more a scientist than I am. And so very rational. Uh, and she looks at this thing. She goes, it's all certified. It's as good. I'm happy to fly in this. Not only that, she programs the, uh, the computer. She does the autopilot. She sets the vertical. She loves doing that. Right. And so, um, it's a, a wonderful platform. Just was in, uh, down at uh, Shell Harbor, which is South of, uh, of Sydney, uh, last uh, last week, John, for a, for a talk, uh, and then flew back up IFR along the coast. Um, yeah, it's about a four hour flight. Um, and you know, I, I land with plenty of reserves, right. With IFR reserves and then some, because the thing has an astounding range actually. Um, or duration, which some people would say, what do you mean range? Because you don't go that fast. But um, but again, as I said, you know, there's unpeopled scenery looking out over the world going, this is this is pretty sweet. I, I am very happy to not be in the back of some 7-3 being flown by some other person. So yeah, back wonderful. to you, John. I could keep talking about my plane. No, it's wonderful. Don't overlook the 172. Some people write uh-uh, it off as uh-uh. a trainer, but I think it's one of the great airplanes for getting around wherever you are. IFR, VFR, it's just a Silky great smooth. all-in-one airplane. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Sydney, at the, every, at the end of every one of these episodes, we always close with a lightning round we call ready to copy. So I'll fire out some questions here as what, fast as the JSA clearance what, controller. Yeah, what's, and this, you, the, you fly. <laughs> what's this nonsense about closing? I'm not done yet. There's <laughs> many other things to tell you. We'll see if we can pin you down here. Let's start off with a really easy, quick, true or false question here. The old phrase, you can never be too safe. True or False. False. Should pilots read accident reports? Yes. What is the right mentality to have when you read those accident reports? What, how do I get something valuable out of it versus just thinking that guy was an idiot? <laughs> Think that could be me. How could that be me? Are autopilots a net positive for aviation safety? Yes, they are. What should we change about how we instruct with autopilots in primary training or instrument training? Remember what we talked about. Don't just show them how the system works or sure, how, how to work the system, but actually how the system works. You talked earlier about working with um, a multi-pilot crew and how you can voice your discomfort. So if I'm flying along and with another pilot and they do something that I think is potentially dangerous, what's the best way you've learned to express discomfort without being confrontational? Right. There may be some situations where you have no choice but to be confrontational because you run out of time. So um, super context dependent, John, and also relationship dependent. The best guarantee for it is to have an existing good relationship already. That's what I found makes all the difference. If you don't like each other, it be, it's very difficult, whatever the level of urgency might be. You mentioned automation surprise earlier. What is that? It's where the automation does something that you might have programmed earlier or you have for, have forgotten to put a particular setting in, dial down the altitude, for example, on your autopilot. Um, and it's um, it continues doing what it was doing or it does something that you weren't thinking it was going to do. Um, and, it, and then it diverges from your expectations of what it is supposed to do. The only way in which you basically see that 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 is the case is in airplane behavior as in why is it not descending why is it turning left rather than right um because the the sort of feedback and real estate that we have to tell about what the autopilot is about to do is super limited in most cockpits even on big airliners and so um that that would be sort of the theory summarized 
You've flown a 737 and a 172. What's one habit you brought from the airline world to your flying in GA airplanes? Uh, two habits. One is call outs, particularly in a heavily automated 172. Um, and the other one is um, do the flow, then, then do the checks. And call outs, even if I'm single pilot, it's okay to talk absolutely. to myself, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, uh, 1,000 to go, right? Altitude capture. Um, and all the modes, I call them all out. Absolutely. Remember, right? I mean, it's nice. And, and I love the way which some, some, and this is not mine. Another colleague came up with this. But, you know, on the autopilot, you might be selecting, but that's the menu, right? What is actually on your plate is in the, is in the mode, con, mode, mode enunciator um, on, on top of your, uh, your primary flight display. That's what's on your plate. That's what the thing is actually doing, not what you ordered on the menu. That's such a great way to say it. I see that mistake mm-hmm. all the time. The pilot pushes the button and moves on, but push the button, yeah, confirm yeah. that it happened on the mode controller, and then wait and make sure the airplane followed that instruction. Yeah, Those absolutely. Are three three yeah. different yeah. steps. Yep. Here's an easy one. What do you think happened to Malaysia Airlines Flight 370? <laughs> Something very tragic, I think, at many levels um, for for the pilot, the family, the decisions taken. Um, and um, I don't want to. I, I'm involved in, in 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 various with my just culture work with with suicide prevention issues as well, and, and that John. So yeah, that cuts a bit close in that sense. But if if it were indeed something like this, but um, the um, it's a good Lord. Yeah. The short answer is this, and that is that the, the literature on this would suggest, um, and we don't know, we will probably never know. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the literature on this says that, you know, if, if you, if you deal with these sorts of things, it's almost like a, an act of workplace aggression rather than just suicide, if that's indeed what it was. Um, and that's how we have to understand it. And, and if you want to intervene in that, right, you need to think about how your organization is configured to deal with this and to see it coming. And so, uh, right, the going postal sort of uh, literature that the U.S. knows very well. Um, I think the, um, the other thing that it shows us is how humble we need to be about the world we fly in, John, because I think it is incredibly humbling in today's world to realize that there are places that are so remote, right, that that things can disappear like that. It's that big things can basically disappear. Um, That's humbling. You mentioned just culture, a topic that deserves its own podcast. But what would be one clue that my organization has a just culture yeah, I think if, if, it, if it considers accountability uh, in a forward-looking way, and that's sort of Ginny Sharp, a colleague in healthcare, who, who came up with that notion, which I think is super powerful, right? As, as long as we think that, oh, well, well, we need to hold them accountable, uh, what we typically do is, well, we need to blame them and, and fire them or something, right? Or sanction them or put them on suspect or yank a stripe off their shoulder or something. Um, that's not accountability. That's just a codification of blaming and looking back. If you have a just culture, you understand that an incident creates impacts, impacts create needs, and those create obligations that lie in the future. Now, as an organization, you're going to start doing things, fixing things, looking at things. Why does it, why do we, why do we not set people up for success? And that's a forward looking accountability that you have jointly. Then you know you have a just culture. You mentioned healthcare there, and you've done a lot of work there. What's a habit from the aviation world that has been adopted widely in the healthcare world? (laughs) <laughs> um, let's not do that. I, let's 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 invert the question. It's just much more fun. I think. What could we learn from healthcare? Um, bedside manners. Um, use a phone call rather than a text, right? Which most docs would prefer, um, right? You don't text. You actually call your patient and explain what the deal is. Um, right? Face up to the conversation. Uh, have that courage. Um, those are things that I would like us in aviation to use from healthcare. Great advice. All right. I've given you some hard ones. Here is an easy one. You mentioned your carbon cub that you fly. Is that the most fun you can have in an airplane flying one of those? <laughs> Do you know that actually depends? Um, Cause the thing is light and noisy um, and, and it's, it's, it's built for a particular mission. And if the weather is 
Oh, John, just imagine, right? It's it's it, it, under the southern sky, right? I've lived most of my life in the northern hemisphere, but and, and pilots who who have been to the southern hemisphere would know southern skies. They're different. They're different both at night and during the day, and certainly around around the uh, the edges between those two. So imagine a golden sunset and no wind, and you have cockatoos um, populating the trees around the airfield. There's nothing, nothing like getting in the carbon cub, leaving the window open and do 60 knots and chase cockatoos out of trees. You know, of course, taking care of the minima uh, and, and altitude requirements, but the, um, uh, and then having the warm wind play through your hair as you do that. I mean, that's, that's, there is nothing better than that. And I look at my 172 and I go, yeah, nah, you're, 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 you're not equipped for that. Right. But then if I look at the trip down to Shell Harbor, I go, yeah, now we want to do that in the carbon cub. <laughs> It'd be super tiring and, and just very tedious at some point. So, um, it really depends. It really depends, but yes, you can have a lot of fun in a carbon cub. Absolutely. Two more questions for you. Your latest endeavor you mentioned to me is a first responder chaplain, which involves talking to survivors, including of airplane crashes. Yeah. What have you learned from that? What's a what's a powerful takeaway you've you've learned from that experience? Shut up and listen. That's it. You don't have the answers. Um, what you will what will come out of your mouth, however smart you think you are, is probably useless platitudes. You know. So shut up, listen, let them talk. All right. Our last yeah. question on this podcast is always the same, Sydney. You have one final flight. We want to know what are you flying and where are you going? Uh, my 172 with my wife next to me, and I don't care where we, where we go, actually, with my childhood sweetheart. We've talked about changing that question because everyone answers the airplane and the person and the destination really doesn't matter, which I think is so oh, telling in aviation. It's really about the people in the airplane. It's not really about the destination. That's actually interesting. There you go. Wow. Wow. Sydney, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Absolute pleasure. Happy to do it, John. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Pilot's Discretion, brought to you by Sporties, training and equipping pilots worldwide for over 60 years. For more episodes and today's show links, visit sporties.com slash podcast. I'm John Zimmerman. We'll see you next time on Pilot's Discretion.